Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's State of the Consumer webinar, the Beauty Tech Glow Up. I'm Carly Skinder, VP of Enterprise Customer Success here at Suzy. For those of you tuned in today who might not know us yet, Suzy is an end-to-end -end consumer insights platform that helps the world's biggest brands connect instantly with the consumers that matter most in driving real-time insights. For today's conversation, I am joined by two legends in the space, Christine Esposito, Managing Editor at Happy, who studies and reports on innovative consumer technology, and Nicole Catcher, VP Future of Retail at L'Oreal, who is revolutionizing the shopper experience for the beauty consumer through her category and her customer leadership. Welcome to the stage, Christine and Nicole, and please do say hello. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Amazing. So in just a moment, we're going to take you through the results of a survey that will unpack how consumers are feeling about beauty tech. This study was conducted on January 19th with a sample size of 1,000 U.S. consumers who identified as users of beauty products. This sample was census weighted across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So let's, let's hop into the content. Technology is everywhere, and it is increasingly infiltrating all areas of our lives. Look at some of the articles we've seen in the news recently. Chat, GBT, taking the internet by storm. For a week straight, that is literally all I saw on my LinkedIn feed. The article on the screen even says it's helping CEOs think. And there have been so many stories over the last couple of weeks debating whether or not AI is going to take away the jobs of humans. The metaverse also continues to be a hot topic as more and more brands are experimenting and interacting with consumers in the virtual world. But it's not just virtual. These interactions are making an impact on consumers' real-world choices as well, even influencing where people are choosing to travel. Beauty, of course, is no exception. And in a category of infinite product choice, Technology is playing a big role in brand and product selection. Of course, CES, which is one of the biggest and most influential tech events, just happened a few weeks ago. And when it came to beauty, there were so many gadgets unveiled from robot makeup to AI creating new ways of even more beauty personalization. The metaverse continues to be a space where more beauty brands are showing up. And beyond the digital universe, we are seeing brands create physical experiences that leverage tech today. You can literally go to Target and get a $10 robot manicure right now. And consumers are responding pretty positively. The manicure is quick, it's cheap, it's precise. But I've also read that it's not exactly foolproof just yet, and it does still require this level of human oversight. Christine, you attended CES and Innovative tech is obviously your wheelhouse. Before we get into the research, can you share some of the highlights that you saw on the ground at CES? Oh, sure, I'd be happy to. So um, just to level set everything, CES is overwhelming. It is spans 11 venues in Las Vegas. I think there's like 2.2 million square feet of exhibit space. So there's just so much to see. And like lack of a better word, it can be really overwhelming, especially if you're a first timer. Um, so when I'm there, I'm obviously covering beauty and personal care, wellness, a little bit of home care. So some of the things I saw span all of that. We saw personalized devices from Amori Pacific. We saw some really cool um, tools, I would say, from L'Oreal. But we also saw things like AR and I saw 3D holograms. And there's some things too you would think that are not necessarily tech, but were there like a house plant that helps clear the air better because it's biotech engineered. So there's just so much going on at CES across the entire spectrum from you know digital tech to tools and devices to the metaverse and AR. It really is a, an amazing place to be. Amazing. Um, I think you said it right, which is that it can be so overwhelming and we're gonna get into some of the specific gadgets and tools and tech that were launched and really well received in, in just a moment. But I think as we can kind of all see, there are a lot of really cool things that are happening in the beauty and tech space, but what do consumers think about it all? 
In this webinar, what we're gonna do is we're gonna explore the relationship between beauty and technology, and more specifically dive into consumers' ownership, understanding, and acceptance of this new and evolving space. Getting right into it with section one, we're gonna talk about beauty and tech ownership. Our insight here is that consumers are happy to go without beauty gadgets unless they really see a specific need for them. And what's interesting here is that when you think about a tech consumer outside of the world of beauty, many early adopting consumers are quick to go out, try, buy the latest tech gadgets, even if they don't necessarily need them. They want in on the buzz. They want to see what the hype is all about. But interestingly, within the world of beauty, we're not really seeing this pattern so much. In fact, our study revealed that one in three consumers don't own any beauty gadgets whatsoever. And the most commonly owned gadget is your very standard hair care tool. Even when we asked consumers what their most desired beauty gadgets were, consumers still were going with incredibly practical choices. We, we asked consumers if they could have any beauty gadget for free, what would they choose if money was no object? And we offered up some really interesting and sort of cutting edge products. And even so, when given this opportunity to choose an aspirational product, they still went with very standard choices. 29% of consumers were interested in a smart toothbrush and 25% in a laser hair removal device. So what we're seeing is that consumers really are sticking with these sensible choices. And so to sum it up, you know, what we're kind of seeing in the beauty space is that the most popular beauty gadgets at the moment are really those that are prioritizing function. And so Nicole, I want to turn to you here because you've, you've obviously seen a lot of new product launches in your time at L'Oreal and before L'Oreal. Thinking about kind of the biggest success stories, what do you think it takes in your eyes to sort of get a product from being a trendy one-time beauty product purchase to really becoming a household beauty staple? Sure, happy to talk a little bit about that. It's, it's so interesting because when you think of beauty, trend obviously comes to the surface, right? And you would think that these beauty enthusiasts would be early adopters. And, um, and so I think it is important to understand that when beauty and tech come together, Clearly, there is an investment of both development and investment in the consumer, not just from a purchase price, but also from an investment in time. And so, um, and so it's important that the product's really understanding the consumer's needs. And so first and foremost, a little nod to Susie, do your research. You know, really, you know, we have endless data available to us. And so, you know, listening and, and understanding those consumer needs is at the forefront of a successful product. But even when we're able to do that and really solve a problem and add value to our consumer, there's also a lot of noise in the marketplace. And so it's incredibly important that, you know, to understand all of the options that are out there to consumers today that are messaging around the value that this product can offer, the simplification it can deliver to your life, the benefits that it can provide you from a your beauty routine, um, that that messaging is direct and received because there is more options than ever before. And then ultimately, we talk about this a lot for years is about the beauty experience. And I think that word for consumers has really evolved over the past few years that, yes, the experience with the product is important, but it also extends beyond that, it extends to you know, is this brand or company providing an experience that aligns with my values? Is it authentic to who they are? Um, and so that 360 experience becomes really important to become one of those sort of must have beauty routine items. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we do appreciate that the, the subtle uh, <laughs> or not so subtle Susan plug, but you're totally right that it all starts with the research and we're going to get into how important building those sort of authentic branded experiences really are. Um, but it's sort of interesting to me that in a world that is prioritizing tech, there's not really that much interest in high tech makeup tools specifically. And in fact, um, when we did our study with Susie, what we found was that 86% of consumers surveyed do not own any high tech makeup tools and 81% do not particularly want to own any. So building those deep consumer experiences that are really grounded in a need 
become really important, right? And perhaps one of the reasons why we're seeing that right now is because we're seeing a lot of makeup innovation focused on being incredibly futuristic and doing something new versus actually solving for this consumer need, which is what you've been talking about, Nicole. Um, so a good example of this is with YSL, the brand launched a first of its kind lipstick printer, which is basically a device that leverages color cartridges and a connected app that allows consumers to choose their preferred lip color of the day. So for example, if I wanted to match the color of my lip to the precise color of my nails, I can literally scan the app and the device will distribute the cartridges to find a best match. So it's cool, it's new, and it's really being described as the future of makeup, but you know, actually on the whole, it didn't really deliver. And even by some, it was described as the worst gadget at CES. And I think the reason why maybe it didn't entirely land was because it is not really solving a specific consumer problem. You know, in some ways it seems like innovation for innovation's sake. And even when we turned to the internet and we wanted to do our, our diligence and our research on the product, we turned to TikTok to get people's honest opinions. And we saw that there is still a preference for traditional. Someone even said that for 300 bucks, she'd prefer to buy many different colors and styles of lipsticks. And another said that they still would prefer to shop for lipsticks in person so that they can manually blend the shades on their hands and really make sure that they get that product selection right. Nicole, you've done a ton of work on the beauty sort of shopper journey and more specifically how to marry the on and offline experiences, sort of blending digital and brick and mortar shopping. So with that context in mind, can you share a little bit more about your point of view of really how to get to the root of what consumers or what shoppers are really looking for in the beauty products so that the tech doesn't sort of feel extraneous to them? Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, I think you said some key words there about this. It was really cool and it was fun. And again, these are words that we really tie back to beauty. And so, at you know, first glance, this really feels like it makes sense. And maybe it does at your first go out, but is it going to be integrated into, you know, solving your needs on your shopper journey? And so something I'm incredibly passionate about is retail. And for me, you know, we talk a lot about what I call the shiny objects. And sometimes that's the cool, fun part of this business. But the functional part of it is sometimes the biggest pain point we have. And with infinite products out there, and yet with a consumer who really loves and enjoys to do her research, we're seeing the map of that consumer decision journey to start long before they're triggered to make a purchase. So they're learning and playing and having fun. But then when the real you know, rubber hits the road and they need to make decisions, that's really where the simplification that I get excited about beauty tech is how can we provide you know, solutions to our consumers to help them find the products that really deliver and meet the needs that they're seeking on that journey. So, you know, we've done extensive mapping to identify those pain points or friction points along the journey. And that's really where I get excited about introducing beauty tech is solving for those pain points to help them more simply make that purchase decision. Absolutely. And I think you, you summed it up right, which is that the sort of brand and consumer experience, it starts early. And I think the, the so what here, as you so eloquently said, is that beauty tech innovation has to be rooted in kind of these deep consumer needs, because what we're seeing right now is that there isn't a tremendous amount of um, interest in high tech makeup tools. And that doesn't mean that brands shouldn't make them, but it is to say that consumers are really expressing a need in these types of products only if and when there is a real problem to be solved. So something super important for brands to keep in mind. Speaking of um, L'Oreal, I think a really good example of a high-tech makeup tool that does this really well, right, grounding the product development in the needs of the consumer is L'Oreal's Hapta tool, which is a motorized lipstick tool designed for people with limited mobility. And here, there's a very obvious need that's being solved. 
A study by P&G found that in 2019, only 4% of brands created products addressing the needs of those with physical disabilities. Christine, you saw L'Oreal's Hapta tool in the flesh. So tell us what you thought about it and how folks in the room were reacting. Yeah, I did get to see it. Um, I was able to get a sneak peek out of it, um, at it during CES Unveiled, which is like a media only um, small venue event where they kind of unveil um, new products and technologies. It's like the day before CES, the show floor opens up and uh, it's a small venue and there's tabletops, but there was a crowd around L'Oreal's um, tabletop the entire um, evening. Uh, the device itself is really amazing to see in person and in action. Um, it, you know, just the leveling ability um, for people with arm disability or mobility issues was amazing. And I think the technology came from another category, somewhere, something related to feeding, helping people feed autonomously. So um, it was just really amazing to see how well it worked. And also, it was also, it's very upscale looking. It's a beautiful device. It's a beautiful tool. So I think L'Oreal really like nailed it in terms of solving a need, but also making it visually um, attractive and a beauty tool. It's not something that someone has to use necessarily because they have some issues, but it was something more that they want to use. It was pretty and it was well designed. So um, it was definitely getting a lot of buzz at the show and it's definitely been getting a lot of buzz after as well. That's so great to hear, Christine. And we see those positive comments on social too. Someone mentions that they have tremors. They see this as a direct solve for some of their pain points in the category. And even others who weren't necessarily drawing on their own personal experiences, they were still just as happy to see accessible beauty and accessible makeup come to the forefront of discussion. I'm sure to your point, Christine, that accessible beauty is gonna to continue to be a big theme and a big trend in 2023 as indicated by the crowds at CES and as indicated by the recognition and awards that L'Oreal has earned for its device. So Nicole, I'd love to pause here for a second. You know, I know you're super close to trends um, and obviously L'Oreal supported kind of the launch of this really impressive product. Would you say accessible beauty is something that you've been thinking a lot about as it pertains to the shopper journey? Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's really easy to get excited about innovation and solving, um, you know, the consumer needs that we're talking about. And I think it's really just the beginning. So in, in this example, you know, then the next phase of this that's equally challenging is producing at this scale and making it available to more people. And so, you know, at L'Oreal, we refer to this as the democratization of beauty. And of course, we have a beautiful way of saying that as well. So, you know, beauty that moves the world. And so, you know, if we take an example that is probably, you know, closer to the minds of any of the people listening of something that maybe is further along in its process. And if we think about um, sort of the, you know, the increased emphasis on health and wellness and specifically how that links to skincare. And then we begin to think about skincare linked to health and wellness and how, how can we make that more accessible to all, recognizing that I think the stat is close to half of Americans, whether it be due to geography or socio demographic limitations, don't have access to dermatologists. Mm -hmm. And so then you think, you know, look, I'm in the beauty business. I live in New York City. If anyone shouldn't be overwhelmed by the skin color aisle, in theory, it should be me. And even I feel completely overwhelmed, right? The choices are endless. And so we've seen through the enormous interest and growth in this category where, you know, we've brought accessibility through bringing beauty tech through diagnostic tools and services to simplify that experience to create personalized recommendations. And it was through one um, survey, you know, that we were sort of doing live insights to hear back where I heard, you know, someone say to me, because I, I often think if you think of the, a, a mass shopper and the price point of skincare can be in the $20 range at times. And to me, that, that seems, you know, it can be pricey for the average American. And the statement was made relative to the cost of going to a dermatologist. And so that really begins to bring it to scale that they were able to leverage some of this beauty tech of diagnostic to get a product recommendation. And to him, 
in this interview, that was a savings. And so to me, that accessibility that beauty tech can bring is a great example of what's happening in skincare. And honestly, I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. Mm, super interesting. And, you know, I think you talked about kind of like democratization and how important it is for products to be offered at scale and at a price point that consumers are willing to engage with. I think another really good example from L'Oreal is, um, and really where L'Oreal is leading the charge from an innovation perspective when it does come to accessibility and democratization of product is its brow magic device that essentially acts as an eyebrow printer where you use an app on your phone that uses AR to choose the perfect eyebrows. And then you take this device, you swipe it across your face and you've got these perfectly printed eyebrows. And what's interesting here is the product is cutting edge, but again, it's satisfying these deep consumer needs, which you both have talked about, right? So it's helpful for people who have mobility issues, for consumers with anxiety who maybe have shaky hands, for consumers who have maybe lost their eyebrows either through cancer or alopecia. This device is solving a real specific need and, and making beautiful eyebrows accessible to all. And once again, because of that sort of fact that it's really grounded in a deep consumer need and the intention is really to democratize and make this product available to everyone, consumers are responding very positively. People commenting that they love the L'Oreal Brow Magic device because their mom is going through chemo and she's struggling with her physical identity because of hair loss. Someone else saying that they really recognize that this device is really great for people who have alopecia. When brands are making products that really serve this clear need or this clear barrier that exists, the chances are that the product's going to be a winner. Christine, you know, commenting on um, what Nicole mentioned earlier around really engaging with consumers and starting those um, digital experiences early and building products that really matter to consumers, coupled with your sort of exposure at, at CES, were there any other kind of really strong examples of brands that hit the mark in terms of building products that were really addressing these deep needs in a way that was democratizing um, or making beauty more accessible to everyone? I think that's a great question. I know since I've been covering CES for a number of years, I think a lot of what we see at CES is um, future forward. It's ideas and concepts that brands are testing and that they think this might be the direction that we head in. They want to solve a problem. Maybe it doesn't seem like it's solving a problem in the immediate moment right then. Um, you mentioned earlier the Target um, nail um, machine robot. And I saw a device, I don't think it was the same exact technology, same company, but they had that at 2017 at CES and everyone was hovered around it. But now you're seeing that in a space like Target. So I think it's offering that idea that tech is there and maybe something down the road is it's solving a problem that maybe it's not immediate, but it is something that um, it will serve people or help a brand reach out and, um, you know, make their beauty more accessible or provide uh, greater access to skin care or skin health and things along those lines. So I think, you know, it's hard to say, um, you know, if I saw anything that was very specific. I mean, obviously, if you look at AR over the years, there's been so much change and so much more accuracy um, in that technology from companies like Motiface um, and also Perfect core. So I think that's an impressive space to watch too in terms of solving it. Um, I'm trying to think of some other examples. I mean, I did see something like a 3D hologram, which was amazingly creepy and real. And it was an actual person you could have a conversation with. So I'm thinking, how is a brand going to use that five years down the road? Maybe that's their link to a beauty expert in a store halfway around the world when they're, you know, in Australia and someone's shopping in New York. So I think there's a lot of examples of things. Um, you know, one thing, if I can just uh, quickly mention, I did get a chance to see Neutrogena and Nourished, and they're working on a uh, skin health uh, vitamin supplement. It's a gummy, and um, it's actually available now. Um, and it's Neutrogena combining their AI, and Nourish makes 3D printed vitamins and supplements so it's personalized and I think that's a really interesting concept um, that was on display at CES and is available now because it 
catch gets into that zeitgeist of wellness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's too early to say if that's really going to be something that's solving a need and taking off. But I think it's something we definitely need to keep an eye on because they've kind of married that wellness and skin health um, inter, you know, that connection and they're taking off and exploring it together. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's goes back to kind of an earlier comment from Nicole. Um, I think what you point out, Christine, is that it is one thing to be on sort of the forefront of technology and innovate and create new products. But I think what Nicole also brings up is it is another thing to actually integrate that technology and make it very much part of consumer experiences. So just in light of some of the examples that you just shared, Christine, Nicole, I'd love to hear from you. You know, your focus is obviously on the customer and the retailer. You know, we, we talked about the example of Target and sort of a robot who's doing nails in the store. How are retailers starting to respond to this type of implementation of the technology in store or online? Yeah, I mean, look, I made I used the phrase earlier, the, the shiny coin, and sometimes we get ahead of ourselves. And so some of this beauty tech is quite fun. And I would say what retailer doesn't want to deliver on that experience. And yet we can also paw, I, I often use this visual of a pyramid when we have these conversations. And, and if your foundation of delivering on the basic needs of your shopper, both online and in store, and that's like, get them the product they want, get them in and get them out. Mm -hmm. They don't really care how many shiny coins you have to offer, <laughs> you know, they're fun. Mm -hmm. And so we often try to level set and bring ourselves down. Yes, plan for the future, but also remain very practical in that, you know, 50 to 60 percent of retail trips are driven on replenishment. And so they want to get in and get out. And so some of the, you know, tech is to support that sort of expedited service before you even get to that, the fun aspect of mm -hmm. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, it's about driving sales, right? And driving conversion. So I think that's kind of a nice segue into our section two, where we're really going to take a little bit of a deeper look into beauty tech understanding and what consumers really think about this tech. Um, and so as we kind of teased in section one, our insight for this chapter is that consumers really don't associate beauty with technology. And so there really is a big opportunity for brand education here. And more specifically, when we ask consumers what came to mind when they when they heard the words beauty tech or were, when they think about beauty tech, many consumers commented on beauty technicians versus anything that was tied to the metaverse, augmented reality, or really any of the other technological advancements, Christine, that I think you saw at CES and you know, continue to be very much talked about um, in the media. The metaverse still remains an incredibly confusing area of beauty tech that slowly brands are starting to engage in, um, but it's still quite confusing to consumers. And maybe that doesn't come as a surprise because, you know, more broadly speaking, only 16% of consumers in general understand what the metaverse is. And yet this is so interesting because we're seeing so much in the news that beauty brands are going all in with the metaverse. But when we ask consumers to name a brand that came to mind when they think about the metaverse with respect to beauty, most struggled to name a single one. And people said things like, I don't know of any beauty brands that are associated with the metaverse or I don't link beauty to the metaverse at all. Someone even said they had not even heard the term metaverse until they took our survey. So what's your take on this, Nicole? Um, I'd love to understand you know, how all in or not is L'Oreal going into the metaverse? And um, because of some of the con consumer confusion in the space, how is the brand sort of educating consumers on what the metaverse e even is? Yeah. So my take on it, look, I won't pretend to be a metaverse expert by any means. I don't think I, not, don't you worry. Yeah, I don't think anyone's taking that claim these days, but I think if, you know what you're reporting here makes absolute sense to me. You know, number one we associate beauty with experience. And so there's a very natural correlation. I've used that word several times already today. And so metaverse is, you know, a virtual experience that can be brought to life. And so it would be a natural fit to associate beauty with it. And so 
So I think there's a lot of momentum behind just that connection alone. And then, you know, some of the quotes here, I laugh because honestly, I think if we pulled 10 people what they had for dinner last night, many would struggle to figure out and recall that. So sometimes you get caught up a little bit in that. Um, but, you know, if we reflect back to pre-pandemic 2019, I would say experience pop-ups physical were everywhere and especially for beauty. I mean, it was all I talked about was bringing the consumer in and having that experience. And now we've lived in what is, you know, known in history as the fastest digital acceleration. And so, you know, of course, as we just sort of correlate those dots together, it would only make sense that, you know, beauty would be invested in understanding this space. I would say we have a road ahead of us is learning and being agile in our discovery. And um, and I don't think our learnings will come exclusively from beauty. You know, I always say that a consumer's experience somewhere else is brought over to ours. And so they raise the bar and the expectation for us. Absolutely. And, you know, so Christine, have you seen any metaverse successes when it comes to brands really meaningfully interacting with consumers in or outside the beauty category? Because I think to Nicole's point, brands are starting to really experiment and learn as they go, but lots to still kind of do and learn. So would love to understand top of mind if there are any kind of successes that you've already seen with brands in the beauty space or outside of the beauty space when it comes to the metaverse. Sure. I think um, we're definitely going to be seeing more of this moving forward. I think there's some companies that are like dipping their toes into the water in terms of the metaverse. I know that um, the Consumer Technology Association, which is the organization that runs CES, they're totally bullish on the metaverse. And they understand that it's still met with a lot of skepticism. Like, I don't know what this is. I don't want to go there. I, you know, I don't game, that kind of thing. But they're saying that it really is what the internet was in the 1990s that at some point we're going to live or have the metaverse be part of our lives in ways that maybe we in 1990 we couldn't envision just on um, the online world is now like you know, we were doing dial up and now look what we're doing online so i mean i think it's that concept that it's coming. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that companies like Fiat, you mentioned like uh, who's doing things outside of beauty. Fiat actually has like a metaverse showroom. Where you can order an electric Fiat. Um, I think it's the 500 model and you can actually interact and, you know, see it. There's like digital twins and there's actually like a human component too. So you can talk to someone about your car. So I think that, um, it's going to get there and we're going to move into that space. I think we will see more activity in some of the other areas first before it really trickles into beauty. But I do think it's coming. And I think, um, you know, it's a way of connecting with your customer. And I think that's kind of the most important part to keep in mind. I know that um, Lancome has done some things with AR and I also believe um, there's a couple other companies that may have done a few things with AR in the metaverse and gaming. So I think they're dipping their toes in the water and they're just trying to figure out what's the best way to connect with my customer and incentivize them to go into this space. And maybe it's finding where your customers are. And if they're in those spaces, then connecting with them there in a real way. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we're going to get into some of the other branded examples within the beauty space of brands that are starting to kind of dip their toes into the metaverse. But I think you bring up a good point, which is that it's we're really just getting started in this space and brands are starting to engage and starting to experiment, but still a ton of learning to be done here. Um, and I think part of where consumers maybe get a little bit tripped up is in the jargon itself, which can make the metaverse feel very inaccessible. Um, I think a kind of funny example of this is Charlotte Tilbury, who recently announced their first ever 3D volumetric avatar. And I even looked this up because I was like, what is a 3D volumetric avatar? Like it's the whole language of the metaverse that's making the world, I think that much more distant and kind of confusing to consumers instead of Christine, to your point, um, really meeting consumers where they're at in terms of the language and the types of experiences and brand engagements that they want to have in kind of this digital first environment. And so looking back at the data, we see that 87% of people say that they've never engaged with the metaverse in the context of beauty. And 
Um, 88% say that they have never engaged with augmented reality in the context of beauty. But what I think is kind of fascinating to consider here, and I think you called out earlier, Christine, is that most people, in fact, have used AR. Um, they've used filters on Instagram, TikTok, Zoom, and social media filters are augmented reality. We just, we don't call it that. And so I think this gets back to kind of the point and the insight here, which is that there is this disconnect between the language that is surrounding the technology and the actual everyday use or implementation of the technology. So really like the so what here is to make beauty tech more accessible to consumers by using language that they're familiar with and engaging around. And I think, you know, a strong example of this, and Christine, you alluded to some other examples, but in sort of the larger retail category, H&M created a virtual showroom and they really named it just that, a virtual showroom, even though it uses 3D technology and virtual reality and virtual technology, they called it a virtual showroom. And so people knew exactly what to expect. Um, and again, it is rooted in something that consumers are already familiar with. They know what a showroom is. This one is just digital. Christine, you have an interesting perspective on brands and how they can talk about their use of technology through things like AI, but I think doing so in a little bit more of a subtle way that's kind of not in the face of the consumer. Can you talk to us a little bit about what you think the right balance is when it comes to brands actually talking about tech or talking about um, the technology that backs their products? Right. So when I was again, when I was at CES, I listened into a discussion with Procter and Gamble, and they were discussing the use of AI um, in terms of formulating shampoo. And the speaker who was involved in R and D, um, corporate R and D, he said, you know, you don't need to um, interact with AI to use our shampoo. And he said, but you should know, or I just want you to understand that we used AI to make the best possible shampoo for you to make sure it meets all your needs and it has the right ingredients. And I think that's a great way to look at it, that someone who's using a shampoo may not need to know what AI is, but they should understand that a company has invested the time to build that shampoo for them. Either it's personalized or it's got the ingredients that they want or they can trace the sourcing. So I think companies need to really understand that not all their consumers are gonna be tech focused and understand it, but they just wanna understand why that product is or that service is the best available for them because they're investing in this technology. Mm -hmm, totally, and I think what you talk about is simplification. And Nicole, you know, beauty is obviously um, uh, an industry that comes from kind of a long background and maybe overcomplicating or over explaining certain product ingredients, so on and so forth. So um, I'd love to hear from you in terms of the importance of language when it comes to product selection and shopping experiences in the beauty space. And again, on the notion of sort of simpli simplicity and simplification for consumers, what does that kind of look like in um, a shopping environment? Sure. So, you know, when when you think about the retailer, um, they really sit at the cornerstone between the consumer and, you know, our marketers and our product developers. And so often that consumer language, you know, they're very simple. We want um, a seamless experience. We want to find the products we need. And it's simply stated. And again, I, can't, I referenced earlier, I'm in the industry. I walk up to the skincare wall and even I feel overwhelmed. And so the retailers really have an enormous challenge that they can they can see firsthand and support, you know, various brand positionings and they really need to streamline this for consumers. And so the language that we use and and leveraging some of those pre shop touch points that we know consumers are engaging in. Again, that's that O plus O experience that she does the research online to understand her needs and arrives in store. But I think it's a it's a big challenge that our retailers are up against on a regular basis is solving for that simplification of the shopping experience. And, um, you know, and the multitude of brands don't make it any easier. Yeah, for sure. And there's also so many different types of shopping behaviors and types of consumers to study. So um, that only kind of adds to the complexity of the problem to solve here which I think brings us nicely to our final section of today's presentation, which is all around beauty and tech acceptance. 
And our insight here is that Gen Zers are actually far less willing to embrace beauty tech than millennials. I'll say that again, because I thought it was really surprising. Gen Z are actually less willing to embrace beauty tech than millennials. This was consistent in all of the data that we saw and really was a bit of a surprise because maybe we expected to see some hesitancy with tech adoption for Gen X, boomers, but Gen Z, they've been raised on technology and the media story is very different from what the data is telling us here. The data showed that um, you know, things were pretty consistent across the board when it comes to beauty tech. Gen Z are less likely to make beauty purchases on social media. 42% of 18 to 24 year olds have actually never made a beauty purchase on social media compared to 25, compared to 33% of the 25 to 34 year olds. Again, pretty surprising to me. And then when it comes to kind of trying on beauty products virtually, 30% of 18 to 24 year olds are not open to virtual try on. And it's not just that they've never used virtual try on and that they would be willing. This 30% actually refers to those who are actively opposed to it compared with only 19% of 24 or 25 to 34 year olds who expressed similar opposition. When we asked about other digital experiences to gauge interest across cohorts, the trend really continued. When it came to CGI and virtual influencers, Gen Z are less open to this idea. 29% of 18 to 24 year olds feel extremely negatively towards CGI influencers compared to only 11% of the 25 to 34 year olds. And when it comes to interacting with brands virtually, 54% of 18 to 24 year olds are not excited about interacting with beauty brands through virtual reality, again, compared to 22% of 25 to 34 year olds. So what we're seeing here is that actually millennials remain key to brands when engaging with consumers in this virtual or digital first environment. Nicole, you've obviously spent a ton of time shopping, studying shopper behaviors across cohorts. Is it surprising to you that maybe Gen Z is so resistant to digital beauty experiences? And how are you starting to navigate these dynamics at L'Oreal? Sure. So I sort of really like this information because in one, it's very thought provoking, right? And it sort of makes you question all that you know and believe to be true. And yet the more time that I spend reviewing these stats, there's a lot of things that do add up for me, actually. Um, and, and two things in specific I'll highlight that first and foremost, there are some very key specific cohorts, demographic cohorts that you know, really engage and just love beauty. And this is a passion category. Mm -hmm. and, and Gen Z is definitely one of them. And so we often refer to this category as digital. High engagement online, and yet still this really strong desire to get up off the couch and go into store and touch and see and, and discover in that physical environment. And quite honestly, that's one of the reasons why this category is so sought after by retailers because it does have that high level of engagement and it still drives traffic for retailers that have you know brick and mortar stores so so that's one aspect and then i would also pause and turn it back on the industry and say you know for someone who's native to a digital experience are we not giving them the right experience yeah Definitely thought provoking and again, kind of uh, surprising to me as I was looking through some of the data. And I think we're going to get into um, in, in just a bit, a little bit more around how Gen Z actually does want to interact. And I think you bring up the concept of digital, which I think very much so, um, you know, was true to the data as well. Um, and I think it's not just beauty tech where we're seeing these types of themes. We're seeing that millennials are the most engaged group when it comes to interest in the metaverse, which is surprising with what we're seeing in the headlines. Um, I thought kind of some of this is funny, right? So it says for, for Gen Z, the metaverse is not a place, it's who they are. We see headlines that Gen Z actually prefers the metaverse over reality, which I think is kind of a scary headline. Um, but what we're seeing very much in the data is that Gen Z are really kind of dragging their feet. Um, but the media story is very much so one of Gen Z fully embracing the metaverse. 
Um, why do you think, Nicole, that the media story is so predominantly about Gen Z engaging? Um, and more specifically, I want to turn our attention to one of the quotes that you see here on the slide, which is, Gen Z is set to lead retailers into the metaverse. Do you think that's true based on your conversations with some of the top retailers? Well, we are actually, I mean, I think number one, we're all a bit obsessed with Gen Z and understanding um, them as a cohort, right? So especially in beauty, because they are such an engaged passion consumer. Um, you know, we're in the process right now. I alluded to sort of our consumer decision journey mapping. And one of the findings that through that work that I discovered along with my team that we wanted to dig deeper was, you know, when you do a broad scope and, and look at the entire consumer base, sometimes you miss those emerging and developing touch points that might be small in scale um, from a use case, but broad in um, in variance. So lots of different touch points, but in small use. And so we really believe that Gen Z provides sort of a predictive nature on the um, sort of the willing to integrate those digital touch points into their everyday behaviors and their shopping trends. And so dialing down really close into what could be considered pretty small touch points, we think really can provide an insight into what the future may hold for, you know, digital touch points that will um, gain more momentum, broad scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you talked about how we're all just a little bit obsessed with, with Gen Z. And um, I think part of the reason why beauty brands, why there's a lot of focus on the Gen Z cohort is because, you know, they have been raised with technology. And so I think there's this concept that therefore they must be at the forefront of technology and they must be willing to, you know, willing and engage, excited to engage with the metaverse. But there is still this hesitation. Um, and what we found in the data is that the number one thing that's giving 18 to 24 year olds pause in engaging in this kind of digital first environment, it goes back to an earlier point you mentioned, Nicole, which is that that must mean if they're engaging in a digital experience that they're not able to interact with or try on those products in real life. And so this physical brand product interaction is really important to Gen Z. Whereas by contrast, millennials are more interested in some of those virtual try on or digital options. But for them, the biggest sticking point is the perception of price and these options being more expensive. So for Gen Z, that was, you know, who was brought up with technology, the fact that they are less interested in kind of virtual almost seems like an act of rejection where they want these in-person and real experiences, which is also true outside of the category, right? It's true of their social engagement patterns with things like be real versus Instagram um, and kind of the concept of having these authentic experiences versus these super polished or refined or edited experiences. And it's not to say that Gen Z is never going to engage with AR or the metaverse, but they are hesitant. And why they're hesitant is because they don't want it to replace those in real life experiences. And so I think in the case of beauty, the concept generally makes sense to me because it is so much a sensorial category. One that you mentioned, Nicole, is so tied to those product experiences that are happening in real life. So much of it is feeling the texture of the cream or smelling that high-end fragrance or blending that lipstick that makes beauty feel so enjoyable, so personal. And I think this is a really key point for brands to make sure that they are striking the right balance between, yes, using technology, Christine, like you alluded to with some of the examples at CES, but making sure that it's really tied to or married to these physical experiences that in the context of beauty are so sensorial. Um, Nicole, you know, you talk about how your focus is, of course, on sort of the both the on and the offline beauty shopper and making sure that the whole experience comes across as one that's very fluid, dynamic, and connected. Any tips that you can share with other beauty leaders here um, about what that actually looks like in practice? How do you keep both the on and the offline shopper journey front and center of the strategies that you're employing? Sure. So look, it's a topic we are obsessed with and one that 
um, is sort of the holy grail of that seamless shopping experience. And for beauty in particular, we talk about the living stage. And I referenced earlier that we're like an always on universe consumer. We're constantly taking in information long before we've been triggered to make a purchase and start on our journey. And so we have a repository of information, of research and Mind, I allude to the fact that also generates an enormous amount of data and information that we can understand our consumers that much better. So then ultimately, once we are triggered to make a purchase, we start off on that journey. Um, but a lot of that work that's already been done and compiling and the research that we know um, Gen Z is quite informed on and knows is believed to be all knowing in this area, um, aiding and assisting them in making that transition to in real life the ultimate goal is for them to not have to start that shopping experience over, to carry over that research and information and sort of engagement that they were enjoying so that when they do arrive to an in-store experience, they're continuing on that journey seamlessly. And the connection of those data points is really the, you know, the holy grail of making that a seamless experience. Yeah. So smart. Oh, I might get my Oops, try this again. Okay, now we're good. Um, you know, I think it's not surprising that Gen Z are really craving more of these in real life experiences that you talk about, because the truth is, is that they also lost a big chunk of their youth to the pandemic. Um, you know, we found a really interesting quote um, from an article explaining that in real life interaction is so valuable, um, especially so to Gen Z following the pandemic and that you know, it's ironic that where we have all been sort of previously craving human interaction during the lockdown, many companies are really diving into the metaverse. They are diving into digital and maybe hoping to replace or shift um, some of these experiences with a false reality. And this is worrisome to Gen Z because, you know, for this generation, um, digital experiences really aren't the novelty. And in fact, it's the opposite. They've been brought up on technology. They have always lived digitally. And so where the digital nature of beauty tech still feels really interesting and novel for other generations, Gen Z has really kind of leaned into being offline as the aspirational way of life. We're seeing this on a lot of different areas. Gen Z wanting to get off the grid to van life, avoiding social media, not wanting to be reachable at all times. The same goes for the work dynamics. You know, a lot of other generations embraced hybrid work for the flexibility that it could afford, whereas Gen Z, they were really excited about the opportunity of having that serendipitous discussion with a colleague or making coffee with a colleague in the office. And, and that's because, you know, many of them entered the workforce digitally. And so for the first time, they're experiencing what it's like to have these real face-to-face -face interactions. And so kind of an interesting insight to think about here um, or reality to think about is that for Gen Z, the physical can actually feel even more novel than the digital, which is really important, specifically in this highly sensorial category that is beauty. So the so what here is that millennials today um, are actually kind of the sweet spot, which is maybe surprising, maybe not the focus for a lot of the beauty leaders here with us today. And so while, you know, while uh, the millennials continue to remain a key focus for brands today to win over Gen Z really requires that brands are delivering on the digital, that word that Nicole mentioned earlier, it's this blend or the hybridization of the physical and the digital experiences that are not solely digital. A really good example here actually comes from the beauty space in the world of skincare, which we've talked about already. So skincare seems to be kind of on the front lines of some of these strategies. Um, and it comes from a brand name, named Inky List, which mainly sells online, but they've recently created this pop-up shop, which really leans into this hybrid model of the digital plus the physical. And even though they don't typically have kind of brick and mortar shops, they set up this physical shop. And when consumers entered, they had to scan a QR code that gave them information about the event, the different products that were offered, et cetera. But then once they were inside, they could interact with the brands. They could try on the products. They could smell the perfumes and so forth, but still ordering the products straight to their homes via a tablet that was placed in the store. 
Um, same thing went for product questions and more information on the products. You know, there were reps in the store who could field some of the questions, but there was also this app that, um, you know, helped them with quizzes, games. So it was kind of this perfect blend of both the physical and the digital, which again is going to remain key to win Gen Z over. So there you have it. Um, we talked about a lot. We talked about brands that are doing it right by grounding all beauty tech in innovation, um, in real consumer needs. We talked about some of the consumer confusion that really still exists in this space that we should all be aware of when it comes to brands interacting um, with consumers and doing so in confusing spaces like the metaverse and how important simplicity in language is. We talked that millennials are maybe surprisingly the cohort that is engaging most with digital right now, despite the focus on Gen Z. And we talked about how brands really can continue to win with Gen Z by blending the digital. So to wrap up our amazing conversation today, I'm gonna to ask each of you to share just any last advice that you have for other beauty experts here on how to handle the beauty tech intersection and navigating some of these generational dynamics that we talked about today. So Christine, I'm going to start with you. Um, what is your top advice for beauty leaders today? Oh, okay. So that's a big loaded question for me, but um, you know, I think my advice is that brands um, and they need to look at tech as a big picture and not necessarily a gadget. You know, it could be tech might be what helps them build a better product. It might be what enables them to interact with the customer in the store in a digital way with a QR code that gives them a digital passport where they can learn more about the ingredients or take them somewhere. Maybe it is in the metaverse with a virtual showroom where the customer is incentivized to go and explore more and then they're going to get some kind of coupon or incentive or a new product earlier than somebody else. So I think there's ways to do that. And my only other advice would be that I think they also need to seek out partners. I think if you look at the leaders in the space like L'Oreal and Procter & Gamble and others, they're at CES and they're at these other venues outside of the beauty space. And they're really digging in and ferreting out some of these leaders who are working on these technologies that are going to enable you as a beauty brand to connect with your consumers, build a better product, you know, form a community, whatever it is. And I think you need to get outside of your space to go and find out who those people are and what's out there. All amazing advice. Nicole, what, what do you have to add? Sure. So, you know, simply stated, and I'll just, you know, I have to start with that shopper and consumer and really understanding their needs. And as you make that evaluation, you know, consider, considering that producing at scale and really being beginning to create accessible beauty in that fashion. And then from an inspirational perspective, I would say really challenge your teams to think differently. Um, I source inspiration from everywhere. Christine, I can only imagine you walking the floor at CES and, and carrying inspiration from one category to another. And I know every experience I have, whether it be buying a dress, you know, driving a new vehicle, um, I always apply to how does this experience apply to beauty? How, what can we do with that? And so really sourcing inspiration from everywhere. I agree. I love it. And with one and a half minutes to spare, that is rare that in this virtual age that things actually end on time. So we are ending on time, but Christine, Nicole, thank you both so, so much for your insights, for your time today. And thank you so much, everyone who tuned in this afternoon. We're excited to keep the conversation going. Get in touch with any of us if you have further questions that you want to chat about. Um, but great conversation. And until next time, team. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.